Hello and welcome to Quality Care Rounds at Partners Community Health. My name is Rahul and I am the attending nurse practitioner at Wellbrook Place, supporting both the East and the West Towers. I will be facilitating these sessions, which are scheduled for the third Thursday of every month. Typically, staff can attend either live in person in the Seniors Hub or virtually online through Teams. These sessions will also be recorded and made available for staff to access on their own time on the PCH YouTube channel. Now the goal of Quality Care Rounds is twofold. First, it is a monthly education series that builds knowledge capacity for staff on relevant health topics to improve the level of care for our residents. And second, it creates a platform to engage in meaningful conversations about these topics by clarifying concerns, and solidifying understanding. Last month, we discussed communicating with healthcare providers. For our February topic today, we will discuss wound assessment, prevention, and management to better guide our day-to-day -day clinical practice in the units. So there are four main objectives to support today's learning. First, we will review some of the most common types of wounds that staff are likely to encounter in our seniors population. Second, we will outline and explain the wound assessment process to standardize our approach when evaluating wounds. Of course, not every aspect of the process will apply in every situation, but the goal is to provide some guidance on fundamental wound assessment. Third, we will identify some strategies that both registered and unregistered staff can implement to prevent wounds from developing or worsening, and then provide more specific guidance on managing the various types of wounds. I will briefly discuss some of the commonly used wound care products, but the goal is to ultimately have our supplier provide some in-depth education on this later. And fourth, we will identify situations that may require wound care referral for further assessment and management. To start, I will briefly provide an anatomical overview of our skin, the underlying tissues, and what exactly is a wound? I tend to be more of a visual learner, so I bore this image from the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, which distinguishes the three main layers relevant to wound care. Looking at this diagram, the outermost layer, which we all can see when we look at our own skin, is called the epidermis and is comprised of five layers. When we break through this, we have a second main layer called the dermis, which comprises all of our free nerve endings and blood vessels that, if exposed, tend to cause pain and bleeding. If we break through even further, we hit the hypodermal layer, which is comprised of our subcutaneous tissue, which is primarily connective tissue to maintain the integrity of the entire skin, and adipose or fatty tissue, which provides cushioning and insulation for warmth. For any wound beyond the hypodermis layer, we now expose our muscles and bones, which is a huge red flag for referral. Ultimately, each layer serves an independent function, but collectively provides a barrier to the subsequent layer below because the deeper we get, the more potential for long-term complications. So in the end, we can define a wound as any injury to our skin or its underlying tissues, no matter how superficial or deep that injury goes. So next, let's identify some of the common types of wounds that we see in our long-term care population. First, there is injury, and some common types include a laceration, which is the clinical term for a cut, and it can be of varying degrees of depth. Obviously, as we discussed in the previous slide, the deeper we go, the more risk to the resident. There's also a skin tear, which is a separation of skin layers often seen with the topmost layer, the epidermis, as sort of a flap hanging attached from one end still. The third is a contusion or a bruise, which is an area of ruptured blood vessels without a break in the skin. Another type of wound are diabetic foot ulcers, which are wounds in residents with chronic, unmanaged diabetes, often related to neuropathy, 
which is diminished sensory perception. So essentially, the resident no longer can feel an area of their foot and therefore is often unable to even distinguish pain, friction, or even dryness, which all predispose to the thinning of the skin and ultimately create an ulcer. A third type of wound is a venous stasis ulcer, which is caused by chronic venous insufficiency secondary to venous hypertension or incompetent venous valves. In other words, the veins are not able to reliably circulate deoxygenated blood back to the heart so they leak out resulting in edema or swelling, tissue ischemia, and ulcer development. This is commonly seen on the lower legs and these ulcers tend to be shallow and have irregular borders. So to understand this, I like to parallel venous stasis ulcers to a piece of paper that is strong and intact when dry, but once you place it over for say, say for example, a tank of water, that excess amount of water softens the paper which it eventually tears then, which is exactly what happens to our skin when it overlies a bed of water or fluid that leaks below it for a prolonged period of time, causing a venous stasis ulcer. These tend to be slow to heal, so keep a high degree of suspicion for residents that are obese, have congestive heart failure, or a history of DVTs and varicose veins. Next, we sometimes may see an arterial ulcer, which is caused by decreased peripheral circulation and these wounds tend to not heal properly at all, which often informs a goals of care conversation with the family about their management. They tend to be deeper wounds with a punched out appearance and are painful with well-defined borders. Some common risk factors include peripheral vascular disease and residents with high cholesterol levels. And finally, we have one of the most commonly seen types of wounds in seniors which are pressure injuries. These consist of localized damage to an area of skin and its underlying tissues when prolonged pressure is applied over a, bro a bony prominence. There are four stages plus an unstageable area for worsening severity. So to better appreciate these five main types of wounds, these next few slides will pictorially demonstrate some of the key visual differences. Now these slides are not meant to create distress for those watching, but instead to help identify these five types of uh, wounds in our residents and distinguish their features from each other. So on this slide, we see the three types of injury wounds that we previously defined, which include a laceration or cut on the top left of the forearm in the top left picture. Then we see a skin tear, which has the exposed outer layer flap that is still semi-attached in the top right photo. And finally, a contusion or bruise in the bottom image where we see bleeding underneath the skin without skin opening. On this slide, we see a diabetic foot ulcer in the top left, a venous stasis ulcer in the top right, and a deep punched out arterial ulcer in the bottom image. Ultimately, many of these wounds share similar features, but the mechanisms for their development is quite different. Now, let's go a bit more in depth on pressure injuries. I mentioned that there are four stages, which are classified based on the visible wound bed. A stage one pressure injury is defined as an area of skin over a bony prominence that is red and does not lose its discoloration if pressed. The skin is still intact as we can see in the first two images of a coccyx stage one pressure injury. The color changes seen in this stage are usually red and do not include purple or maroon, which is a deep tissue pressure injury. Next, we have stage two, which involves partial thickness skin loss of the epidermis, the outer skin layer, with an exposed dermis layer. The wound bed is usually pink or red, moist and consists of viable tissue, meaning it is healable. Deeper layers of subcutaneous fatty tissue, muscle and bone are not visible. New forming granulation tissue and non-viable tissue such as sloth and eschar are also not present. 
In a stage 3 pressure injury, the skin is obviously open and we have penetrated through the dermis and now the subcutaneous fatty tissue is seen. Granulation tissue, sloth and eschar may be present. The wound bed may include undermining and tunneling, but muscle and bone are not visible. Now if the wound bed is not adequately visible due to tunneling or extensive sloth and eschar, this is now an unstageable wound because as I mentioned, pressure injury wound staging is classified based on the wound bed. Next, a stage 4 pressure injury includes full thickness skin loss and tissue loss where muscle and bone are now visible. Now, if we look at the wound bed and the bottom is not adequately visible due to tunneling, sloth or eschar, we cannot determine the extent of tissue loss so this is an unstageable wound because as I mentioned, pressure injury wound staging is classified by the appearance of the wound bed. Theoretically, if the sloth and eschar are removed, the wound is likely to be a stage 3 or 4 pressure injury because of the full thickness skin loss. A similar type of pressure injury is a deep tissue pressure injury, which is classified by persistent, non-blanchable, deep red, maroon, or purple discoloration. This contrasts a stage 1 which is red in color. The skin is usually intact but it may be open in specific situations. So now that we know some of the common types of wounds, how do we assess a wound? For that, I will introduce to you a four-step process. Location of the wound, describe the wound, describe the area around the wound, and state any symptoms that the resident experiences associated with the wound. Wound assessment should occur with every dressing change. For step one, identify the location using appropriate anatomical landmarks. For example, the coccyx, which is the lower back area. For step two, describe the characteristics of the wound starting with its base, which is essential for staging. State the color, Pink or pearly is epithelial tissue, which is the covering tissue. Red with a bumpy surface is granulation tissue, which is new connective tissue to fill the wound along with the supply of new blood vessels. Yellow is sloth, which is a type of necrotic tissue that contains cellular debris and it is stringy. Black is another type of necrotic tissue known as eschar, which is dry and hard. Remember, viable tissue has a vascular supply, while non-viable tissue does not. Next, describe the size of the wound using analogous clock distributions. So for example, the length is measured from 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock, which provides orientation for the wound as well. Now the length is the longest aspect of the wound, width is the widest aspect of the wound perpendicular to its length, and the depth refers to the deepest part of the wound, which can be determined by inserting a sterile cotton tip applicator. Next, identify if there's any undermining, which is a separation from the wound bed along its edges, any tunneling, which is a narrow opening that extends in any direction and is a potential for abscess formation. Quantify and qualify any drainage, such as serious or clear drainage, sanguinous or bleeding, serosanguinous, which is a combination of the two, or purulent discharge, which may indicate infection. Be sure to describe if there is any odor as it may also indicate infection. And describe the wound edges as, a, as it is an indication of wound healing. Step 3. For the periwound area, indicate if the skin is intact or if there is erythema maceration, induration, scaling, or scarring. This is important as it may expand or introduce a new wound so the peri-wound area must be protected. And the fourth assessment factor is to describe any symptoms associated with the wound such as pain, swelling, fever, and an evaluation of the peripheral pulses. Next, let's talk about how to prevent wounds.
Some risk factors that are associated with wound development include advanced age, comorbidities such as diabetes, venous insufficiency, and dyslipidemia, medications such as steroids, immunosuppressive agents, incontinence to bowel and bladder, and reduced intake leading to dehydration, skin dryness, and inadequate nutrition are also additional risk factors. Some others include decreased sensory perception as seen in neuropathy, poor vision which leads to tripping and slipping hazards, and impaired mobility such as an unsteady gait, being bedridden, friction and shearing forces, and persistent pressure from immobility. So if these are the risk factors, how can staph prevent wounds from developing or worsening? Some strategies include skin assessments every shift, including documenting any changes, timely toileting, and incontinence care to prevent skin breakdown, having a routine bathing schedule along with daily skin moisturizing, consistent repositioning such as a minimum of every two hours, and applying barrier cream to highly affected and risked areas. Now, I'm going to describe five general guidelines for managing all types of wounds. We will go into some specific wound related recommendations in the subsequent slides, but please use these guiding principles as a general outline for wound management. Step one, consider offering pain medications 30 minutes prior to the dressing change to minimize discomfort. Step two, remove the current dressing. Now this is a clean procedure, so regular disposable gloves are sufficient. Step three, assess the wound using the four step process that I outlined earlier. Location, wound description, peri-wound characteristics, and associated symptoms. Step four, wound cleansing and disinfection. For cleansing, Irrigate the wound with normal saline, which removes debris, sloth, and necrotic tissue. This also serves as a type of mechanical debridement, which is the removal of non-viable tissue to promote wound healing. Normal saline is first line because it is isotonic, which means its solute and water concentrations are the same as our cells to prevent fluid shifts when cleaning. Some alternative solutions are tap and sterile water. If necessary, the wound can be disinfected with iodine, which is an antiseptic agent used to reduce bacterial load. An alternative is chlorhexidine, but this solution may cause more allergic reactions, so it is best to consult with the healthcare provider if iodine is unavailable. It is important to note here that sometimes Wound cleansing can precede assessment to better visualize the wound bed. Step five is wound packing and applying a dressing. Now for deep wounds, packing is necessary to prevent premature epithelialization so wounds do not close without new granulation tissue filling the space from the bottom up. Next, we will go into some more detail on some of the commonly used dressings and their purpose. This slide is meant to visualize some common principles when managing wounds. In the top diagram, granulation and epithelial tissue are considered viable tissue and therefore should be safeguarded to facilitate wound healing. In contrast, sloth and necrotic tissue are non-viable and must be debrided as their presence in the wound bed prevents healing. In the bottom image, Wound edges that advance and begin to approximate to one another are considered a part of the healing process. If the edges are not advancing, a further assessment is required to optimize wound healing. On this slide, in the top image, the emphasis is on moisture balance to promote wound healing. If the wound has an excess amount of drainage, or the peri-wound is macerated or excoriated, we want to absorb that excess drainage. In contrast, if the wound is very dry, we want to add moisture to facilitate healing. In the bottom image, we describe bacterial load balance. Many wounds are easily contaminated, which is the presence of microorganisms, but they are not replicating, and there is no immune response by the host. Therefore, simple cleaning is sufficient, 
which is why in the wound management guiding principles that I outlined, wound cleansing with normal saline irrigation can minimize contamination. Next, if the presence of microorganisms begins replicating and proliferating, but there is still no immune response by the host, we now have colonization, which may require debridement. If the resident mounts an immune response at the wound site, then we have a local infection and can treat it topically with antibiotics. And finally, if the resident begins exhibiting a body immune response as microorganisms have disseminated from the wound location, we have a systemic infection and must treat it with systemic medications such as oral or IV antibiotics. Overall, these Two slides emphasize the goal of identifying and protecting viable tissue, promoting wound edge advancement when appropriate, and maintaining moisture and bacterial load balance as key areas to focus on in wound management to facilitate healing. Now, let's briefly discuss some wound-specific management strategies. For skin tears, we want to optimize the resident's nutrition and hydration status which may necessitate an RD referral for guidance. It is important to also assess the resident's gait, ensure the correct use of assistive devices with padding, and maintain a clutter-free environment for ambulation to prevent falls, all factors that can decrease the risk for encountering a skin tear. Staff must also ensure that the resident is having adequate and consistent skin care routine which includes proper washing and applying moisturizing cream to prevent the skin from drying out and predisposing to skin tears. Wearing appropriate clothing such as long sleeves and pants can reduce the risk for friction and shearing forces that create skin tears. In terms of dressing changes, if a skin tear is present and it is bleeding, firm pressure should be applied to stop the bleeding. You may consider applying an alginate dressing if the bleeding is heavy as it has hemostatic properties but it is not commonly used for simple skin tears. If a skin flap is present, approximate and cover it over the wound bed to protect it. You have the option of keeping the wound open to air to facilitate healing but may also consider applying a clear acrylic transparent film dressing if there is a risk for the wound to worsen. This type of dressing is semi-occlusive, transparent, and waterproof. It decreases friction and shearing forces, but still allows the wound to be visible through the dressing. To manage diabetic foot ulcers, we want to first optimize the resident's blood glucose levels, so an appropriate consult with the MRP and RD is necessary. Next, ensure that the resident is using appropriate footwear wearing moisture-wicking, non-skid socks, and the shoes are non-tight fitting. You want to routinely assess the resident's peripheral pulses, sensation, and pain to evaluate their risk for wound worsening. Ultimately, a referral to the MD or NP is needed to guide wound management. Some key principles for addressing diabetic ulcers, which is similar to most types of wounds, is to first identify non-healable tissue, which is, for example, dry ash scar. For this type of tissue, staff should not attempt to remove it themselves and instead should keep it dry by painting it with iodine. Next, if there is a fillable space, such as in deeper wounds, we want to pack it with a filling dressing that as there is a risk for abscess formation and premature wound closure. Packing prevents that and allows the wound to heal from the bottom up. Next, we want to manage any excess exudate or drainage to balance moisture, which facilitates wound healing. For excess exudate, apply an absorbent dressing. And finally, we want to protect healable tissue by removing debris with mechanical and autolytic debridement and ensuring good moisture balance to promote granulation tissue formation and eventual epithelialization. To manage a venous stasis ulcer, we want to elevate the affected limbs such as the leg to decrease edema. Also, monitor the resident to avoid prolonged sitting or standing episodes 
as this elevates their risk for leg swelling and ulcer development. Ultimately, like a diabetic foot ulcer, we want to refer to the MD or NP for wound management guidance. Staff may anticipate the possible use of compression stockings or bandage application to reduce swelling and should monitor for infection such as cellulitis and dermatitis. Some signs of infection include warmth, erythema, edema, increasing drainage, pain, and foul odor. For an arterial ulcer, staff must complete comprehensive daily assessments which include checking peripheral pulses, sensation, pain, nutritional status, and for signs of infection. These ulcers require an urgent referral to the MD or NP for wound management guidance. Now let's shift towards some of the more common types of wounds staff will likely see, starting with a deep tissue pressure injury. Some management strategies include preventing skin breakdown, which you described extensively in a previous slide. Two main preventative components should be repositioning the resident a minimum of every two hours and applying barrier cream to the wound area. If a dressing is applied, consider using a clear acrylic transparent film dressing to reduce the friction and shearing risk to the wound bed. Be sure to always apply the no sting barrier film to the peri wound area as this is healthy, uninjured tissue which we want to protect when applying an adhesive dressing to ensure that we do not damage it when removing it. For a stage 1 pressure injury, the management is identical to a deep tissue pressure injury. We want to prevent skin breakdown by repositioning the resident frequently and applying barrier cream to the wound bed. If there is a high risk of the skin opening and the wound progressing to a stage 2 pressure injury, apply a clear acrylic transparent film dressing while making sure that the peri wound area is protected. To manage a stage 2 pressure injury, Again, repositioning a minimum of every two hours is important. For dressing changes, selecting the appropriate wound care product is dependent on the amount of drainage from the wound bed. For low exudate, consider a clear acrylic or more likely a hydrocolloid dressing which is effective in non-infected wounds with minimal drainage. It has some moisture retention which is the ability to absorb excess drainage and maintain moisture balance to promote wound healing. This dressing is breathable and flexible. If there is moderate drainage, consider a hydrocolloid or more likely a foam dressing, which provides cushioning support for the wound bed to minimize pressure and it, it has high moisture retention to absorb excess drainage. For large, large exudative wounds, consider a foam or even alginate dressing which has high moisture retention, but it also promotes autolytic debridement of debris in the very moist wound beds. Alginate may also be considered if bleeding is a concern with the wound. If staff suspect a wound infection, consider using a silver or an alginate silver combination dressing. Silver dressings have antimicrobial properties which are important for bacterial load balance. A referral to the MD or NP may be necessary if antibiotics are required. Ultimately, deep tissue pressure injuries as well as stage 1 and stage 2 pressure injuries can and should be managed by registered staff independently as it is within their scope of practice. Use the five wound management guiding principles and these wound specific considerations in your approach. For the more complex stage 3, 4, and unstageable pressure injuries, seek guidance from the MD or NP. Some important wound management considerations for these types of wounds may include debridement or removal of non-viable tissue so viable tissue can proliferate and heal. This, this can be done by staff by applying hydrogel which promotes self-debridement or irrigating the wound by mechanical debridement. If there is a fillable space, it should be packed. Some options are with dry gauze, iodine infused packing strips, or alginate silver strips. For drainage management, 
Hydrocolloid dressings can be considered if the exudate is low, foam for medium and high drainage, and alginate for high and bleeding wounds. For bacterial load management, a silver dressing should be considered as well as local or systemic antibiotics if the resident is exhibiting signs of an infection. So now that we have described general and wound specific management strategies, when should staff call the MD or NP for guidance? First, if the wound is worsening, as it is not healing despite staff interventions, or it is growing in size, these situations may require more unique wound instructions, so a referral should be placed. Second, a referral should be sought for complex wounds to rule out infection and for possible special orders such as packing and wound specific dressings. Some examples of complex wounds include diabetic foot ulcers, venous stasis ulcers, arterial ulcers, and advanced pressure injuries which include stage 3, 4, and unstageable wounds. Third, referrals should be sought if staff suspect infection. What this may look like locally at the wound is erythema, edema, increasing drainage, foul odor, worsening pain, or increasing wound size. A more severe systemic infection should be suspected if the resident develops a fever, hypotension, or chills. And finally, a referral should be sought if the resident's symptoms are worsening, such as increasing pain, a fever, or decreased intake. Ultimately, simple wounds should be managed independently by staff, whereas these four situations outlined on this slide necessitate a wound care referral for guidance. So in summary, a lot of information was presented in today's wound management session, but here are some key takeaway points to keep in mind. First, some common types of wounds staff are likely to encounter in our seniors population include injuries such as a skin tear, diabetic foot ulcers, venous stasis ulcers, and arterial ulcers, and more commonly, pressure injuries of varying stages. Second, wound assessment should be done by staff on every shift using the four-step process of location, wound description, pair wound area characteristics, and symptoms. Third, some strategies that all staff can implement to prevent wounds from developing or worsening include repositioning a minimum of every two hours, applying barrier cream to appropriate areas, timely toileting, and incontinence care, and optimizing the nutrition and hydration status of the resident. Fourth, the five wound management guiding principles for all wounds include administering pain medication prior to addressing change if necessary, removing the old dressing, assessing the wound using the four-step process, cleansing and disinfecting the wound, and then packing and dressing the wound. It is important to note that sometimes irrigating the wound prior to assessing is needed to remove debris that is obscuring the visibility of the wound bed. And the final summary point is understanding which situation staff should seek a wound care referral. For simple, uncomplicated wounds such as small skin tears, deep pressure injuries, and stage 1 and 2 pressure injuries, staff should manage independently. For complex or worsening wounds, or if the infection is suspected, a prompt referral to the MD, NP, or ET nurse may be required. And that concludes our February session of Quality Care Rounds. Thank you, and we hope to see you again next time.